we are live thank you good evening friends and welcome to this 15th episode of all india post graduate teaching program which is a new initiative from arc aios in this season this is a pg program with a difference because it covers the uncovered aspects of teaching programs like case presentations general clubs oskis and didactics on topics which are not comprehensively available at a single go in a textbook last episode was a journal club so today we present in this series a didactic lecture on refractive errors in children what's new which has been a long question in one of the ms finals in last few years today's didactic lecture would be pro- presented by professor dr minakshi swaminathan ma'am who is a visiting professor, uh, professor at uh, shri ram chandra medical college chennai and also she was a academic in charge at Sh- uh, prestigious shankanetrale chennai my special thanks goes to dr anjali chandrasekhar who is an additional professor and consultant pediatric ophthalmologist at uh, sadura my hospital hyderabad dr smita deshraj who is also a consultant pediatric ophthalmologist and squint specialist at ahalia foundation eye hospital kerala and our own dr inkal fusate who is a consultant pediatric ophthalmologist and squint specialist as a specialist at sarakshi netralaya nagpur i'm thankful to all the three discussant for being with us okay. last know. journal club we had a visit uh, we had a viewership of more than 1500 usually the viewership were very in hundred to around 3500 So with this uh, uh, short introduction, I would request now Dr. Minakshi, Madam, to share her screen and begin her presentation. Most welcome, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, let me just open my presentation here. um is it visible yes ma'am yes ma'am All right great um dr prashant thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, talk about a relatively rare topic which is what's new in refractive errors uh, the two pediatric refractive errors it gave me a chance to go back and uh, read and see what is relevant for the postgraduate for the exam and also what is important for practice when they once they are out there in the real world i'm very excited to also have uh, three um, very qualified young uh, discussants who uh, you know i welcome them to comment at the end of the didactics with uh, you know their own important pearls take home pearls okay i have no financial disclosure so the goals of my talk are going to be uh, discussing presenting advances in screening for refractive errors in children technologies in amblyopia treatment and recent trends in myopia management so these are the relatively three new areas that we will cover today so post graduates what is important for your exam from th- this topic well in the theory you could be asked about myopia epidemiology and control of myopia progression you could very well be asked about vision screening in children newer modalities because they also always have a paper on uh, new developments new modalities at least dnb paper 4 is usually uh, that's what it is and new treatments for amblyopia all this could come in your theory exam for the practicals you have um, you, it, you could have any aspect of this as an oski low dose atropin could be in a table viva uh they could keep a dim segment if they have one and ask you questions about it and uh, they could show you a photo screen or photograph and say you know hey what's going on here as part of table viva uh, in pediatric ophthalmology all right so it's important for your exam let's talk a little bit about vision screening now any of you who has interacted with kids uh, realizes why screening is so important in children because they often will not have any subjective complaints and um, they're often uncooperative for detailed testing and conventional testing is not possible come on read the chart ha read the chart it's, it's many or many times it's not possible and but early detection has impact on lifelong vision and 
Detail examination is time consuming because it involves putting drops, cycloplegic refraction, it takes a lot of time and uh, manpower. So this is an ideal situation to screen for, to look for refractive errors in children. Okay, let's do a little bit more about uh, screening. So really, what does a screening do? It identifies those at high risk for eye disease or in need of a professional eye exam. It may detect disorders in an early treatable stage. Not only that, you get a chance to talk to the parent, the caregiver, give them some valuable information. And ultimately, hopefully, the child after screening will be referred to the appropriate uh, professional. But remember, the screening does not give a diagnosis and give a treatment plan. The screening is a screening. It only identifies those at risk. All right. So you may ask, okay, where to screen and who can screen? Can everybody screen? Absolutely. So when I was a, a, a fellow in University of Iowa, Iowa, in Iowa, Iowa City, the malls used to have a screening center where photo screeners were used by volunteers to screen children. So yes, primary care physicians, family doctors, pediatricians offices, school nurses, even community-based settings, school eye camps, all these are excellent opportunities for screening. And very often the screening can be done by trained volunteers. But however, don't forget, it cannot stop with screening. The gold standard is a comprehensive eye exam for those who fail screening. So what do we have? Well, this is the day and age of apps. We have a vision screening apps and PEAK is a portable eye examination kit. That's what it stands for. It's an, it's an app there are, uh, which uses the tumbling e-chart. There are also others called the Sightbook and iChart Pro, which use a Snellen. So these can be, these are typically loaded on the mobile. Parents or school teachers may administer. See, it's very useful in low income and remote areas where the family may not be able to bring the child for an eye test. Um, or it, it may be an underserved, underprivileged area where they do not have the facilities or they do not have the, the money or the transport to really come. And here, this is where a screening app is very useful. Uh, the drawback is really that we have not tested the accuracy and reliability. They're better than nothing, but scientifically, we don't know really how accurate they are. Moving on from the apps to photo screeners. So the principle of a photo screener is basically an infrared camera that takes images of undilated eyes. Remember, the screening should not involve a lot of time and effort. No drops are necessary. Undilated eyes. So it estimates the eyes defocus, which is derived from the distribution of reflected light across the subject's pupil. You don't have to remember this for the exam. Just remember that the camera is infrared. What does it measure? What does it pick up? It pick up, picks up actually plus minus 7.5 diopters for spherical errors and plus minus 3.5 diopters for cylindrical errors. That's a pretty good spread that the photo screener will pick up. It also, some of them also do pupillary size, interpupillary distance, and gaze deviation. So, really, what does it flag? A photo screener flags any of these refractive errors, anisometropia, difference between the two eyes. And because it looks at pupil size, anisocoria, and also strabismus. All these are, can be picked up by the photo screener when they are used for screening and then referred to for a comprehensive exam. Really, what is the advantage? The non-invasive, handheld, portable, quick, less than 10 seconds. So imagine the number of kids you can screen and how efficient the system is, right? So I wanted to uh, pause here and tell you a little bit of history. So this, look at this huge mammoth, uh, mega instrument was the MTI photo screener. I could barely lift it when I was a fellow, uh, but we have come a long way from there. But this was the initial, the first prototype, the MTI photo screener, right? 
And uh, the disadvantage, of course, like I told you, first of all, was cumbersome, heavy, and the photos had high variability and required an expert reading center to provide the results, but it was a great beginning. But we have come a long way from the MTI photo screener. We have other more easily handleable ones like the power refractor, the plus optics. And again, the referral criteria is classified according to the age group. Again, going back, remember the referral flags. These can pick up anisometropia, astigmatism, myopia, hyperopia, and isochoria strabismus. All these can be flagged and referred. So really, how good is it? You want to, whenever you talk of a screening tool, you have to know sensitivity and specificity. And look here, the sensitivity is really good for myopia, not great for hyperopia and strabismus, but the specificity is very high. Two more for you, for you to remember. The well shallon Spot Vision Screener, 80% sensitivity and specificity, and the eye screen, where they actually the images are sent via the email to an interpreter who sends the results. So that's really all I have about vision screening. And so if you're asked about vision screening or instrument-based vision screening, I'm sure you will be able to write uh, a good answer. All right, now we're going to talk about new technologies and therapies for amblyopia. Again, a very brief section here. If you're asked, you need to be able to write at least a couple of paragraphs. So the new kid on the block, which has been around, say, for the last about five years, is our digital therapeutics in amblyopia. So there is a new class of software-driven interventions using binocular modalities, and we'll talk about that in a second. There's a lot of interest about this amongst the media and parents. Also, they are being marketed pretty aggressively. Various studies and even a Cochrane review published in early 2022, they show hmm, no clear indication for efficacy, but you know they are, seem to be pretty good at picking up anisometropic amblyopia. Strabismic amblyops are not really that great at, uh, for, um, they are not really good for treatment of uh, strabismic amblyops, but anisometropia, they do well. And compliance is better, but costly. And some of them, there is also a risk of myopia progression. So let's quickly see what is the principle on which these binocular therapies are um, administered. The images are presented dichoptically, a high contrast image to the amblyopic eye and a low contrast image to the fellow eye. A task needs to be completed by the eyes working together. And this has been adapted to the iPad with a game which uses a red green anaglyphic glasses for a dichoptic presentation. So if you remember the word, the terminology dichoptic, that it covers the entire binocular therapy for uh, amblyopia. So the first one, and which kid does not love a game? Okay, so the first one developed was the dig rush and uh, followed by others, luminopia one, vivid vision, cure sight, and there are many more in the pipeline which use the principle of dichoptic therapy uh, to uh, give amblyopia treatment, all right? All right, one little slide about refractive surgery for amblyopes. Again, a little bit of a controversial topic, um, but pediatric refractive surgery in moderate to severe amblyopia, if it has, if there is severe anisometropia, severe isoametropia, facial anatomical anomalies and other special needs where spectacle wear is difficult. Like we once had uh, a kid who was um, uh, had special needs kid, minus 13. The child's whole development depended on the child improving with spectacle wear, but the child would just not comply. We're just throwing the glasses every time. So in such a situation, yes, you can offer refractive surgery. Or you, you have to, before you do anything, you have to show that you have tried fail and, and, the, and the patient has failed standard amblyopia therapy, okay? Any type of refractive surgery and it can be offered. And you know, um, the refra refractive surgery literature says a lot of improvement is there. There is refractive error comes down, vision improves, stereopsis improves, and communication skills and activities of daily living, especially of this uh, vulnerable population definitely does improve. But there are definitely several limitations. And so we are going to need further studies uh, before it becomes more popular. 
All right. So that's about refractive surgery. And I'm going to talk next about recent trends in myopia treatment. And this is the hottest topics in ophthalmology worldwide is uh, in both ophthalmology and vision research, vision science is uh, myopia. So let's talk about um, uh, what is there for myopia out there in this day and age. All right. So what is the big deal? Why are we talking about control the myopia, control the myopia? What is the big deal? Because every one diopter increase in myopia increases the lifetime risk of myopic maculopathy by 67%. Okay. And every reduction by one diopter reduces the risk of myopic maculopathy by 40%. So just look at this graph here. Okay. You can see it shows cataract, retinal detachment, and myopic maculopathy. And just look at the minus six and above, five times risk of cataract. Retinal detachment, 21 times once you cross minus six. And look at the myopic maculopathy, cross minus five, 41 times lifetime risk of uh, developing myopic maculopathy. That is why myopia control is important. So um, amateurization and normal ocular growth is a concept that you have to understand. So really what is amateurization? Precise matching of axial length and optical power of the eye. So with the next few animations, we're gonna look at what happens when a child is born, a newborn, has about plus two to plus four diopters of hyperopia. Over the next, by the time the child is two to between two to five years of age, that slowly the hyperopia reduces, becomes about 0.5 to one diopter. And by five to six years, this process of emetropization, where basically the child does not need, does not have any significant refractive error that happens by five to six years of age. So this is modulated by hyperopic visual feedback in neonates, right? So what else happens in the eye other than the refractive error? Let's look at the axial length. Uh, so if you look at the axial length, it's about 17 millimeter at birth and more than one year becomes 20. From two to three years of age, the axial elongation is about 0.4 millimeter of year up to preschool and stabilizes five to six years, and a very minimal increase through the teens. Not only does the axial length increase, there is reduction in the power of the cornea and the power of the lens. And there is reduction in corneal astigmatism in the first four years of life. They are, the kids are born with very steep corneas and slowly this flattens out, okay? Now, let's talk about a little bit more about axial length. So now from this, you understand that the major ocular growth is complete in the first six years of life. In the child destined, destined for emetropia, the corneal curvature reduces and it's quite stable. The growth of the axial length is balanced by flattening of the crystal, crystalline lens. The cornea flattens, the lens flattens, and the growth of the axial length so kind of tapers. Right. So, but what happens in myopia? So we just talked about that before age 10, that is when the child's are, children are still emetropizing, there's only 0.1 to 0.2 millimeter per year change in the axial length. Aha, if impending myopia onset, you can predict by axial length growth of more than 0.2 millimeter per year. And progressing myopes show at least 0.3 millimeter per year growth up to the 10 to 11 age. So if you're following kids serially, if this the axial length starts increasing more per year, this already tells you this child is, is, is onset of myopia is impending ah, and myopia progression is happening, okay? Now, the average age of axial length stabilization is about 16.3 years. And it stops at about 25.5 for males and 25 for females, even with similar refractive error. Anything more than this, you know that they're set, they're progressing, all right? How do we know all this? I don't want you to remember the details of this slide. Just remember, SCORM study, CLEAR study. 
These are the studies that showed us a lot of the axial length data, okay? All right, so let's do a little bit more about the fundamentals. I want to keep impressing upon you that axial length is the key factor that determines who becomes a high myope, who develops really bad problems. So look at that. On the left side, you see this uh, axial length, 24 to 26, 26 to 28, 28 to 30, and more than 30. And just look at the odds ratio and the prevalence, uh, odds ratio of cataract by age of 60 and visual impairment by age of 70, uh, 75. It goes on increasing as the axial length increases. Look at that axial length more than as 30, 25 times risk of you developing visual impairment by age 60 because of cataracts, 90% prevalence of visual impairment by age 75. That's terrible, right? So really, what is the key message? If we can keep the myopia below minus three and the axial length below 26, it's a huge modifying factor for lifelong risk of visual impairment. So this should be your goal. You're sitting out there and a child has come to you and the child is already minus 0.5. Your goal is to see, hey, what all can I do to keep the myopia below minus three, minus three? And you have to have some axial length data to support your treatment plan. All right. Okay, moving on. So ah, I forgot I put animation. All right. So uh, you may come back to a very fundamental question, which parents all the time ask, why did my child develop myopia? Well, genetics is a very important, is a very big uh, deal. And genetics is what decides the age of onset of myopia, the rate of progression, and the final refractive error. So if one parent, two parents are myopic, all this determines whether the child will become myopic or not. How about the environment? Very, very important. Children who are outdoors a lot, less myopia. Higher IQ, higher socioeconomic status, higher education, all associated with higher myopia. Urban environment, yes, higher myopia. Continuous near work for two hours or more, absolutely higher myopia. So, you know, we're all living in a time when people, which kids are getting pressured uh, in the school. Kids are being put in school. Uh, they're not even out of their diapers. They're already in preschool learning. And kids are going from class to class. Half the population is addicted to mobile phones. Uh, mobile phones are not used as babysitters. So we're having so much near work is being thrust on the children. But environment is a very, very big, big contributor to myopia. And remember what all can go wrong if the myopia progresses, right? So, so identifying the likelihood of myopia progression. So you already know who's at risk for myopia, but who is going to progress? If you're Asian ethnicity, and I'm talking of Asian, I mean East Asian, because most of the studies have happened in Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, China, younger age at onset, strong family history. And I just talked to you about the visual environment and finally binocular vision conditions. And we'll talk about that in a second. All these determine whether a, a child will progress or not, okay? And um, so, you know, we just talked about outdoor, remember? Outdoor time is very important. If you talk about anything to your uh, patients, talk about the outdoor time. Why is outdoor such a big deal? Because outdoor light levels are 11 to 43 times higher than indoors. Look at the difference in the lux. And genetics and environment can interact. So you can modify the environment by increasing the outdoor time. Myopic adults have lower levels of ocular UV exposure compared to non-myopic adults. This was uh, shown by studies because somehow outdoor time seems to, outdoor sunlight, natural light seems to release dopamine and dopamine acts to control uh, myopia progression by controlling axial length elongation, all right? Now, how do we know this? This is important because there, there, it was even a term called COVIDopia because post-COVID, because of the quarantine, there was a huge increase in the uh, incidence of myopia, right? Okay, now we're going to touch upon myopia and binocular vision. So myopia is associated with inaccurate and insufficient accommodative behavior at near, which is called 
high accommodative lag, which means the amount of accommodation that needs to be ha happening for a certain uh, target is not happening. So that's called accommodative lag. These ten, uh, children tend to progress. Increased accommodative convergence in comparison to emetropes. So esophoria, kids with esophoria tend to uh, progress. Now I'm not going to, I can't go into details of this and you really don't need the details for the exam. But remember, binocular vision anomalies, esophoria, higher accommodative lag, higher chance of progression. All right, now you know who is at a risk for starting, uh, for developing myopia. You also know who is going to progress. You know what are the genetic factors, what they determine, what the environmental factors are that determine who becomes myopic. And now you have to manage the myopia. So this is just one poster that talks about how to manage. Sorry, that's my PG here. And I'm just realizing she's been looking at my face. So I'm asking her to look at the slides. There you go. Um, so uh, the clinical pillars in myopia management provide advice on the environment, assess and manage binocular vision, prescribe optical and pharmacological treatment. So we talk a little bit about each of these. What do we talk? What do we mean by advice on environment? Two hour rule, that is outdoor time versus near work time balance. You need to have at least two hours of outdoor time. I've been practicing pediatric ophthalmology for a long time. I have yet to see even one single child who spends two hours in the natural light because they are going from school to extracurricular classes or school to tuition. So you have to get really imaginative how you're gonna fit the outdoor environment into the child's schedule. Please, each one of you out there, when you become a practicing ophthalmologist, please go out there and talk to the schools, talk to the uh, school authorities, how the outdoor time is really, really going to help the kids long term. What about the 20-20-20 rule? Basically, it means take regular breaks for every 20 minutes from near, if you're doing continuous near work, especially the board exam going children. Every 20 minutes for 20 seconds, look at something 20 feet away. That's the 20, 20, 20 rule. The elbow rule says, keep your elbows like this against your torso. And, and that is where your near work should be. Nothing closer. That's the ideal reading distance. Assess and manage binocular vision. We already talked about looking for esophoria and accommodative lag, because if you treat these two, the myopia progression may diminish. What about optical and therapeutic pharmacological treatment? The pharmacological treatment came uh, uh, to India, say about seven or eight years ago, and it's basically low dose atropine. We are still working out what is the ideal low dose atropine for our Indian eyes. Uh, the 0 0.01 is pretty effective, but there are other trials in, on the way. And, and also we have a, many, many optical treatment options now. And we will look at each one of these in a little bit more detail in case you are asked about uh, therapeutic interventions for myopia progression, you need to be able to answer. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about what you will tell the patients, uh, the parents. Early morning sunlight exposure, maybe the Surya Namaskar that you know used to be in our culture is, is, is in our culture is, as something, as a merit. So early morning sunlight exposure, two hours of outdoors a day with active tracking, what does that mean? Because there are now there are trackers that tell you how much the child has been outdoors. Preferable with movements and sports. Remember, school recess time has to be outdoors. Open, well ventilated houses. Study table near a window. Distance viewing from balcony, terrace, window for the 2020 rule. And the red light lamps at night is a bit of a controversy, but it's there on this list anyway. And I'd uh, love to hear what the discussants have to say about that. Let's talk about the pharmacological agents. So atropine, perenzepine, and oral 7 methyl xanthine. These are the ones that have been studied, but uh, atropine is the most prevalent one. 0.01% is marketed a lot in, in right now, world over and in India. How does it work? We don't know for sure. Initially, it's thought to be due to the effect on accommodation. Then modulation of dopamine release, 
M1 to 4 receptors in retinal amacrine cells. Then uh, these bind to other receptors and release of dopamine, which inhibits eye growth. Direct effect uh, on scleral fibroblasts and which interferes with scleral remodeling, inhibits glycosaminic glycans. And if you have so many uh, mechanisms, you know nobody is very sure. Right, but it, it's a uh, it, it has made a lot of difference. Use of low dose atropine. Now there are landmark studies, atom one and two and three. Uh, we are going to find the results very short, shortly. And the lamp study, which looked at even a, a more variety of concentrations of low dose atropine. So for the exam, you uh, the table why you may be given a bottle of the low dose atropine. If you're given something and it says atropine sulfate. Please don't start talking about 1% atropine. Always check the concentration of the drug, uh, whether it is 1% or is it a low-dose atropine that is used for myopia progression. So don't get caught on that uh, little thing. All right. Um, I'll just go back and just pause here. So at, ATOM stands for Atropine Treatment of Myopia. And uh, the first one studied placebo versus 1% and the second study multiple con concentrations. And it is only after atom two that we know that 0.01% is considered the most efficacious. All right. Pyrincipine, no need to know details. If you know the names is good enough, was studied, uh, discontinued. 7-methylxanthin. Again, uh, there is, uh, it's safe to use, but I don't think it's uh, available. The prevalence, uh, it's not available uh, widely. All right, so pharmacological treatment, if you remember low dose atropine of various concentration, but 0.01%, the most uh, important, that is good enough. Now we're gonna uh, cover the myopia control glasses and this is the, uh, the last bit. So uh, several, several types of glasses are there and single vision, bifocals, progressive, dims, hal, dot. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about each one of these. Single vision glasses, uh, they only work for correction of myopia. They do not work to stop the progression, okay? That is, they do not work to control the progression. Always give full correction. If they themselves induce peripheral hyperopic defocus, and we're going to see what that is, because many of the new technology of glasses, the new breed of glasses work on minimizing this peripheral hyperopic defocus, all right? So uh, here it is. So it goes on in the concept of peripheral refraction. So we all think of eyeball as like a sphere, right? But it's actually prolate. This is my own drawing, so forgive the uh, little bit of squiggly drawing. So this is the, this is the prolate eyeball. So if you see, the central rays of light are all coming to a point focus, but because it's really a prolate eyeball and not a good, nice looking sphere, the, the uh, prolate here, the, the peripheral rays think, hey, you know what? This is still hyperopic. We are not in focus yet. Okay, focus is gonna happen behind us. And so what happens? The eyeball grows for the focus to happen. Okay, so this is called peripheral hyperopic defocus. I hope that's clear. It is because of the prolate eyeball shape and not a sphere. So uh, that is the basis of all the other important types of uh, lenses that we have now. So PALS, progressive addition lenses and bifocals, they were really found to be useful, especially the PALS and the COMET study. And you remember we talked about a high accommodative lag? So if children have high lag, the PALS are useful, but myopia control, really, they are not a big, big help. So if people ask you, what is the role of PALS? It's only if you have detected high accommodative lag. Right, so now we go to the most specific ones, the peripheral aspheric design. It's a peripheral defocus lens with single vision distance, 10 millimeter diameter central zone, and an asymmetric shift to an add about 25 millimeter from the center. You just remember that there is a different zone. There are two zones, right? So how effective is this? And the, and the brand name was Myovision Pro. How effective was this lens? So around 20% refractive efficacy in Chinese children aged six to 12 with the family history of myopia, right? But point when compared with the uh, single vision lenses. 
Uh, refraction seemed to be affected, but axial length, there was no big change. So we need better ones. Peripheral aspheric design is okay, but it's not really up to the mark. So that's where we come to DIMPS. Defocus, incorporated, multiple segments. Just remember DIMPS, we're all talking about defocus. That's what the D is for. And the, the, the defocus segments are inside the lens itself. And they are multiple segments. That's what it is. And it's marketed as MyoSmart, MyHoya. Similar, what I told you about the peripheral defocus. And these segments actually uh, correct that peripheral defocus. Um, so it, the efficacy around 50% refractive and 60% axial length efficacy was found. So they're not bad. Half there. The next type is HALT, highly aspherical lenslet technology. And if you see compared to the previous one, which only had one big zone, this has got a more like a 3D uh, sort of effect, uh, like a more volume effect. And that's how it works, actually. And see, this creates a three-dimensional quantity of light in front of the retina called the volume of myopic uh, myopic defocus and a little bit more efficacy 70% refractive and 60% axial length efficacy all right so that is halt and this is these are the latest which is called the dot lenses diffusion optics technology and uh, i'm not going to go into the details uh, this basically uh, how it works is it corrects the abnormal contrast signaling between neighboring full and empty cones and that it, it is believed that the abnormal contrast signaling is what calls, stimulates the axial elongation. And this, the dots lenses corrects that abnormal signaling. All right. Contact lenses, moving from glasses to contact lenses, there are many, many options. There is multifocal, dual action, zone lenses, Adolf lenses, distance center focus design, orthokeratology. And so if you see, the multifocal contact lenses works just like the multifocal um, glasses the, with different segments, similar to, similarly the Adolf lenses. So the same thing that you saw in spectacles happens to be shifted to a contact lens. Uh, so there are many examples of this as well. And corneal reshaping technology is orthokeratology. So if you're asked in the Viva, what is this? Have you ever heard of it? You need to know. Here, the lens is worn is by the patient in the nighttime, which reshapes the cornea and offsets the refractive error. It's not for very uh, high refractive errors. That's the only limitation. So I'm going to go back and just revise. You already understood the environmental modifications, the two-hour rule, the 2020 rule, the elbow rule. Uh, all the ways in which you can enhance the outdoor and minimize the indoor, manage binocular vision anomalies, uh, give progressive addition lenses if there is accommodative lag, prescribe at low dose atropin or and or the uh, spectacles or contact lenses, the special myopia uh, control spectacles or contact lenses. These are just as complete. There is there's, uh, supposedly subscleral injection of mesenchymal stem cells and dopamine. Posterior scleral reinforcement for the really high uh, uh, myop, to, uh, supposed to halt the axial elongation. Again, these just list them in your theory. Don't No need uh, to know even more. Newer trends are on the way, obviously. There are even better glasses people are trying, newer atropin doses, newer contact lens, stem cell therapy, et cetera, et cetera. It's all going to be coming in the next few years. And so with that, I will stop my presentation and uh, will hand it over to the discuss discussions and uh, if you have questions, audience have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, madam, for a wonderful presentation. I also learned a lot of about pa pediatric myopia and all. As a retina specialist, away from the specialty, I was extra, I mean, attracted to a lot of myopia control suites and all they were talking about. But you have opened my eyes that simple tricks can, uh, you don't need such big things. Probably that's what an uh, impression I carry. Now I expect all the uh, discussion to carry forward the discussion. Uh, Ma'am, that was a very wonderful talk.
uh i i just wanted to uh, like ask whether uh, because there's so many options available maybe do the residents have like a flow chart as to what indication uh, because there is atropine there is glasses there is contact lenses so based on any particular uh, kind of indication which one is more suitable than the other or something like that like a flow chart kind of thing uh i'm i'm sure that is but because the the technologies are uh, the um what is available is available is constantly evolving so i can tell you my approach and uh, i'm sure you all treat uh, being now part of big institutions i'm sure you treat uh, as many myops if not more than i do but i can just tell you uh, my approach so i am a very i'm i'm uh, so first first thing we do when i uh, when we see a myop is to get a good history which includes a family history and get a good idea about the environment uh, what the child is happening has, how the day goes so i actually sit and ask what happens what time does the child uh, wake up what are his activities uh, what time goes to school after school what are the work uh, what what kind of tuition etc he goes to he or she goes to what happens in the breaks how many pt periods a, a week i actually get a detailed history because after covid we really saw the children who spent time a lot on online schooling and zoom classes and all that definitely progressed as vis a vis kids who said hell to hell with school and just played cricket outside okay so i i am a very big believer in environmental modification right and i think these are very very important especially in kids who have a genetic predisposition so a good family history followed by a history of the child's environmental exposure to outdoors during the day and the challenges right it also gives you how much academic pressure how much how much gadget learning happens how much screen time happens all these things so i think the history is just very very important to get that detailed history from the parents okay number one after that history taking happens and then um definitely get a cycloplegic refraction uh, sorry before that look for accommodative lag and um esophoria right so accommodative lag you need to know a little bit of how to do a even if you know a little bit of dynamic retinoscopy you can pick it up and then you have to do a cycloplegic refraction as you know but if you can counter check it with an auto refractor then you have at least two readings your own reading and an auto refractor reading right so and a non contact biometry so we talked so much about axial lens so of course i i didn't tell you go into details of that but ideally you need a non contact bio, biometry like an iol master or one of those right so this these this is the basic work up that is needed before you start and uh, so you can again uh, you know please uh, add your comments but i always start with just only environmental modifications for 6 months not treatment right away unless a child has shown clear progression under some uh, under a reliable uh, in a reliable practice and has just progressed a lot and there is family history of high myopia both parents are myopic family history of retinal detachment these kind of things then usually we'll start treatment right away otherwise environmental modification because i think once you start the treatment right the parents just forget about everything else they think ha ah, some magic medicine the madam has given and uh, yeah here here is the cell phone you can sit and watch uh, play games so 6 uh, months of environmental modifications and then start treatment and as you know we had the low dose atropine came here before uh, the the uh, special glasses came right the special glasses are uh, the halt and the you know the my my uh, smart are all still expensive correct yeah. right? so um, i i have no financial <laughs> thing with any of these but they're still expensive right so what is at that point you have to decide how early are you starting atropine and how many years are you going to continue so if the my, if the child is very young then now that you have these myopia control glasses available i think one can start with them um follow them and then decide whether you want to add the atropine if you start with atropine wait till the second year one year they may continue to progress so i uh, i think that's in a nutshell please add your comments as well how do you approach do you approach it differently 
Absolutely, ma'am. I do agree with uh, your approach. And uh, the most important uh, point in uh, maintaining the uh, follow up of the patients is I. Uh, what I have found is not to start everything at the same go. It's very very important to insist on uh, a very quick follow up, like a, a more uh, quicker follow up, and then introduce the things gradually. Rather than giving everything at the first go, uh, they absolutely start feeling that. Uh, these uh, glasses are going to uh, set everything all right and they need not bother about the other environmental factors that uh, we insist uh, on adding so compliance is very big issue on parents side more than the child side that is what like uh, we face i completely agree the same for me also for me the major roadblocks are reducing the screen time because i feel now the parents are also as addicted as the kids are so when i say that you have to reduce the screen time immediately you can see the facial expression changing for the child and for the parent because for most of them they'll give the phone or the tab in the kids hand and then go around doing their own work and uh, even making them wear the single vision glasses is a big Uh, i don't know for this area where i practice they have lot of myths that if they start wearing glasses they are going to lose whatever vision is remaining so that i am still at that level i sat on the fence with the uh, low dose at drop in for a couple of years myself because i'm a little conservative so i did not want to try a new drug for which no long term studies were available like initially the studies were only for 2 years only then we got it for 5 years and now the natum 3 will be coming but i feel that compliance is a major problem for what is it drop in with me new the new glasses i have not tried madam i have no personal experience so, low dose atropine uh, yeah sorry no go ahead please please, please. Mm-hmm. low dose atropine we had been using uh, uh, since long time now and uh, the uh, that is what the uh, one uh, one or two key uh, points that uh, i would like to uh, give to the students is that uh, it is important to know when to start this low dose atropine you are not going to give all the kids low dose atropine low dose atropine should be started only when you have documented or there is a substantial documentation available that the myopia is really progressing uh, a myopia of 0.5 diopters increase since last 6 months so that is a good starting point so that is for the like of course for the students that that is one good point where then you should be considering uh, uh, starting low dose uh, atropine also in the first visit uh, it, it is always a good idea to give a, a faint uh, indication to the parents that why you want to see the child more frequently because in case you see such a increase in uh, such a progression in myopia then you are planning to start such a therapy so that is a good factor which makes them come back and follow more diligently good points i uh, the other thing i wanted to mention about uh, gadget uh, use so what i uh, have been telling them now for a while um, is if you can afford a smart tv project whatever you the child wants to watch Uh, of course if you know in chennai it's very, it's not uncommon in the saree and jewelry shop the women will be handing over a tab to the child and the child will be sitting quietly and they will be shopping happily it's a very common uh, you know a scene so then you can't do smart tv and all won't work but this otherwise if they're at home you say okay this put whatever the child wants to watch whether it is coco melon or you know peppa the pig you please project it on uh, the smart tv and that way at least uh, it is not a handheld device the other thing i tell the uh, kids who are you know progressing they are in their that that teens early teens and uh, exams are picking up you know they etc so i tell them you do your exam revision in the balcony balcony terrace the two places you have your breakfast in the balcony do your homework in the balcony you know that amount that that is uh, enough for the environmental i mean that is good enough good starting point for environmental uh, when you say say ask them do you go outside they say ha ha they we go after the homework is over 7 o'clock all the kids in the apartment will play 
they don't understand it's the light that is important so uh, what i like i told you what i found is to really take a detailed uh, history of their day how it goes and try to insert your treatment into their day i think that that really is uh, as we were talking don't introduce everything at the, at a go start with environmental modification call them back then see what's happened to the, the their refractive error what has happened to the axial length then take uh, start intervention number 2 uh, dr anjali you haven't uh, spoken um, I'm, I'm, so I work in a trust hospital, so for me, it's always a debate like uh, because of the cost factor of these glasses. No, I really, even though uh, there are people who ask once in a while, but I'm not uh, very sure, like, unless that cost is reduced. So we we tend to give more of atropine, actually. Uh, the, uh, the issue with atropine is like one of uh, Dr. Rinkle was saying is that they, uh, they don't buy it again. Once they take a bottle, they think it's the end of therapy after three months. So there's a lot of attrition with that group. So it's very important to actually... Uh, discuss with the parents the whole thing before starting like it's almost like consent and you know tell tell them the whole thing consent for the drops and for the glasses you i i i've also over the years realized you talk much more to the progressing myopia parent than even to the surgeon more than the squint surgery that much counseling is required how, uh, ma'am, in our practice, I always was speaking with Dr. Inkel with, uh, without those specialty glasses and the way to uh, take the peripheral vision and all those. We feel we are uh, not practicing the real pediatric ophthalmology. What do you feel about it, the importance and really which are the cases where we should be investing into all this technology? Not at all, uh, Dr. Prashant. I, I too now, I don't have the luxury of a big institutional backing. I work in a small practice now. But I think uh, our uh, focus, I don't think it makes a big difference, actually. I, like I said, you as long as you can monitor the refractive error accurately, and as long as you can monitor the axial length, even if you can do it once a year, I sent it across to another hospital that has uh, axial length uh, non-contact uh, biometry. That, you know, that again is not possible all the time, but at least to kind of the, the high risk patients, at least in those with high strong family history, that is more than enough. That's all you need. The, the uh, others have shown the way that this works and that works. And if your patient can afford and it's available in your city, you can offer these uh, other options. And uh, like you said, if you're working in a, a type of hospital that you cannot provide or you cannot, the patients cannot afford, we still have low dose atropine. But attrition is, I understand. So maybe knowing what or how all the myopia can ravage the eye. So maybe it is a good idea to keep a database, have a social worker, just like we used to track patients, you know, have a social worker, somebody keep a myopia database and call them back. Uh, you know, send reminders. Everybody has WhatsApp. So send WhatsApp reminders. The child is due for a checkup. Child is due for deciding about continuing medication. Come back. So I think that may be the way. So you don't need anything fancy. <laughs> Just need time. Cannot agree more than. Pardon? I cannot agree more than that, like because uh, the, I believe screening is uh, screening more children is more important than uh, these technical, uh, you know, follow up things. And PG's peripheral refraction is important for theory exam, but uh, yes, and, yes, yes. and perhaps in a big institution where they will uh, hopefully someday show us the way uh, where it really fits in and uh, how uh, important is it to decide about the next step of uh, management. But for now, I don't think it is critical or crucial. One point I just wanted to add, I think reti learning retinoscopy when you're doing your post-graduation is also one of the most important things because when I earlier when I was at the institute, it's such a mental block for that thing because it's time consuming and it's difficult initially. And now because we have the auto refractometer, so most of the people were like not interested in learning retinoscope. I can't agree more. It's in uh, yeah. pediatric ophthalmology, uh, like, I mean, doing retinoscopy is bread and butter. You just have to. Yeah, you have to know it well. I completely agree. And also, only if you know, do good retinoscopy, you will be able to pick up the accommodative lab. 
otherwise you will go on uh, treating the patient and patient will continue to progress so i think it's it's very important absolutely and uh, definitely ma'am like uh, retinoscopy is the more reliable that is what i have found over years more than uh, your auto refracted reading uh, your retinoscopy readings uh, are more reliable definitely more reliable and also for pgs i think it is important to know how much refractive error uh, uh, should be treated at what age like what should be the good age to start uh, what kind of refractive error like hyperopes many a times i have found like they are more confused about how much correction to give especially hyperopia like we are not talking much about today one question for the post graduate when should be the cut off limit for using an atropine as a cycloplegic whenever you are uh, doing a refraction there is a question on my dashboard yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah. and when should we use the other cycloplegics is a common question they are asked during practical so that's what i think yes yes sir any age limit or how do you decide ki i should use atropine versus a uh, routine cycloplegic in a pediatric case so uh yeah if i i can answer that so on in infants up to 1 year of age uh, uh, atropine is not recommended because the blur the residual blur itself can be amblyogenic so after 1 year of age uh atropine uh, i think should be used uh, if there is um hypermetropia that is le led to uh, accommodative esotropia for sure so accommodative esotropia even if say the initial visit you have done a cyclopentylate refraction or a home atropin refraction but i think in the follow up visits at least a few times atropin refraction is mandatory especially if there is residual esotropia so that is usually that's my approach anybody else can answer any uh there is a question in the chat box which says it's from nafizatul miziria Ma'am, which age group we can prescribe DIMS glasses? How long they have to wear? I think one of the persons can, one of the discussant or Minakshi, ma'am, you can take this question. Um, wrinkle, if you if you have yes, like yes. DIMS age, na DIMS glasses. Uh, uh, one important thing, uh, when you have like uh, stable enough refraction. you don't have to go for dims glasses right away only when the myopia is progressing then only and uh, like my uh, protocol is like i try low dose atropine first even after the low dose atropine if the myopia still progresses after one year of therapy of low dose atropine then only you should think about dims glasses and uh, there is no proto uh, uh, the studies haven't mentioned what should be the cut off age but practically speaking very young children uh, should be avoided we we should be avoiding dims glasses because uh, for one major reason they are very expensive and uh, very small kids they tend to break their glasses more often also but uh, how long to wear there is no uh, cut off point or uh, there is nothing given in the studies only thing is like you have to monitor it according to the progression of myopia if the myopia is still progressing the dim glasses are not useful for that kid minakshi ma'am what what's what, uh, your comments uh you know how it is wrinkle if you start talking about yeah. myopia we can talk for the next few hours and you <laughs> we are talking for yeah dr prasad you have to come up with another uh, uh, webinar that's the only way i mean and, and we still will not come to a consensus we'll still be talking that's, about that's very true um, yeah that's true the, yeah i i agree with you that the thing about dims or any of those glasses is the uh, cost is prohibitive and the second thing is even though the company says that they will replace one uh for free or whatever the other thing is the positioning of the glasses if the you know it, the younger tends kids tend to wear it in you know crazy ways if it's not properly positioned it won't work at all and uh so and also they they came much later to the market and uh, so most of us i think are comfortable with uh, low dose atropine 
uh, as the first uh, line of treatment. But uh, having said that, uh, there are if you if the kid is say five years old and you you anticipate another ten years of atrophic use, you are better off just starting off uh, dims if the patient can afford. If the if they can afford the glasses, so um, I don't think there is a cutoff. I don't think the company says you can start only after this. Uh, I know there's a cutoff for refractive error. Uh, how much up to how much it can correct, but not for the age. Okay. So if there I are think like now, like yes, because yes. like we are talking about refractive errors in children. We are not just talking about myopia. Uh, so uh, hyperopia and astigmatism uh, should also get a little bit of uh, light over here. And uh, for PG students, a uh, hyperopia is more amblyogenic than myopia. So if you are you find a child with hyperopic refraction, which uh, uh, a hyperopic manifest refraction, it is more important to correct it right there. In myopic children, if the child is very young, you may take that risk of giving the glasses a little bit later also amblyopia is more uh, uh, profound in astigmatism if it is uncorrected so correcting the astigmatism complete correction of astigmatism is very important uh, many patients from periphery that we see is that they are having minus 3 or minus 4 of astigmatism and they are given glasses of only minus 1 of cylinders so that is one wrong practice that we see and astigmatism should be fully corrected so that is one point for the pg students anything new in hyperopia control and uh, astigmatism control besides you are asking for yourself sir now <laughs> yeah i am asking for my own uh, information i i couldn't find anything that's why i didn't include those in the talk okay only the photo screeners don't pick up these errors uh, as much as uh, they screen myopia that's what our experience with plus optics was uh, so photo screeners which are used for uh, random screening uh, they do miss lot of this hyperopia which is there 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 is sensitivity is much less for hyperopia yes. so i think we had a wonderful discussion overall today I, uh, so it's now time for it's almost we have done our time, and we also had a very fruitful and an interactive discussion. So it's time for us to thank Dr. Minakshi Ma'am for such an enlightening talk, and I think our students would have learned a lot about myopia control, and they would be in a better position to answer that difficult question which was asked some time back in one of the DND or MS exams. Also, I am really thankful to Dr. Anjali, Dr. Smita, and our own Dr. Inkal. for having a beautiful discussion which was hopefully interactive as well as informative for my post graduates so thank you once more each one of you for contributing to our young turks young students and find finding and sparing time for this at this hour which is a dinner time for most of us so thank you once more everyone so students it's time for us to say bye bye but we will be back again on the following thursday with some other topic till then it's time for us to say bye thank you one and all thank you thank you ma'am thank you so thank you ma'am thank, thank you ma'am